of Hope, welcome to Pulse. And because this is the day, you're supposed to ask me, what day? Okay, okay. hold on. Don't screw my play, okay? So hold on. Here we come again. Welcome, Cathedral of Hope. <laughs> this is the day. Ah, what day is Chris? A day that the Lord has exactly. made. Exactly. <laughs> this is the, the day that the Lord has made for each one of us to enjoy the love, to enjoy praising with other brothers and sisters, to enjoy this beautiful place where we can be together as one. So let us pray together. We thank you, God. We thank you for this day because we're preparing ourselves to receive you, to feel you through the words, through the music, through our brothers and sisters today. And we ask you to prepare our hearts so through the word of you today, through our brother Andre, you can speak to us and you can deliver that message that you want us to know. Prepare ourselves to be you in this world and to be the instruments of your love and your peace, your joy and your hope in this world. So let us rise and let us be ready for this day because this is the day that we need to rejoice in the name of the Lord. Yeah. Thank you. Y'all ready to have some church tonight? This is our new song. It's the power of one and it's the theme of this whole month. Here we go.
Come on, tonight the theme is one voice. The power of one voice. So we're going to shout it from the rooftops in this place tonight.
you just bow your head with me in this place tonight? As Veronica said, God of many names, we come into this place tonight from many different walks of life, all relating to you in a different way, all feeling different emotions in this house. God, I hear you calling us, giving us permission to let go, to let go of those things that keep us from having that freedom to truly engage with you. God, I feel you giving us that freedom and just giving us that permission to worship you however we see fit in this house tonight. You taught us a long time ago, way back in the scriptures, that the power of one voice can heal a nation. That the power of one voice can set someone free. And I ask that you would give us the strength to all tap into that voice tonight. That voice that is burning on the inside of each of our souls. That you would give us the strength to tap into that and be like those people of old, that cloud of witnesses that when you came to them in the Bible, you, they said, here am I. If you look back in the scriptures, just about any time that God asked somebody to do something and a miracle took place, it started with a, here I am. So I challenge us tonight just to be open to that, here I am. I may not understand it, I may not know what's going to happen tomorrow, but here I am. So just sing this simple little chorus with me tonight as we prepare our hearts for the word that God has for us. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely. All together worthy. All
Yeah. Oh. No, you just stay there. You stay there. <laughs> I just want to, uh, uh, just a moment of personal privilege. You know, uh, Cathedral of Hope, we are such a blessed congregation. Uh, we have people from many, many different backgrounds and traditions who come together for worship. And I don't know about you, but that makes me very excited about where Cathedral of Hope is moving and where Cathedral of Hope is leading, I believe, the Christian church of tomorrow. And when I first got into Dallas all those years ago, um, there was a little Pentecostal guy who came to my office and said, I just want to be of service. Uh, whatever you need me to do, I want to do it for you. I want to be your support. I want to be your cheerleader. I want to be someone who comes behind you and is alongside you and make a difference in the ministry because he also believes in Cathedral of Hope. And so over the last year or so, uh, uh, Andre and I have uh, had really good friendship and relationship. And just over these last few months, more specifically, as he's been preaching for us, but there is a plan, I believe, for Andre's life and a plan that includes Cathedral of Hope, and a plan that I believe is going to lead us. So um, I want you to pray with me and with Andre because um, you know, we have several people in this congregation who are ordained in other denominations um, uh, who are ordained. I don't care really what the name above the church is, but they have been in ministry and for one reason or another have, have stepped away from ministry. But through the witness of Cathedral of Hope is stepping back into ministry. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that Andre uh, comes amongst us and um, I'm working with Andre because I want him to be a volunteer associate minister here at the Cathedral of Hope mm -hmm. and to really bring his gifts to us. So would you please welcome my colleague and my friend as he comes to preach, Reverend Dr. Andre Vlock. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Pastor. I appreciate that. Oh, and oh, thank you, Sister Erin. Uh, would you say with me, God is with me. Now I want you to say it again with a little drama. Move your head a little bit and say, God is with me. Now I want you to say it again, but I want you to believe it now. I want you to say it. I want you to drink it in. I want you to say it like, like God is with you despite what's been going on in your life. I want you to say it despite the fact that you might have had a difficult week. I want you to say it despite the fact that you've been down, that you've been cheated on, talked about, mistreated, uh, scorned on, you've bucked, you've been talked about since you've been born, you've been up, you've been down almost to the ground. I want you to say it like you mean it. God is with with me. God is with me. Now give him a big hand clap of love. Would you do that? Amen. As long as I got King Jesus, I don't need nobody else. It is good to be in God's house with you tonight, and I am so grateful and uh, thankful uh, to Reverend Neil uh, for, for allowing me and giving me the privilege of, of standing before you. I got excited when I saw these one signs. I thought, well, finally we become a oneness church and uh, we are Jesus name only. And then I saw Donna's haircut and Sylvia's red lipstick. And I thought, nope, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. We are not Jesus name only. How many of y'all are watching RuPaul's Drag Race? I tell you what, I think I, think I some of us have lost our calling. I mean, it is a last, anyway, it's a wonderful show. If you haven't, if you haven't been watching it, um, I encourage you to do that because it is a blessing every week. I can't wait to watch it. Um, that has nothing to do with tonight. Uh, I want to, again, I just want to thank Reverend Neil uh, for the privilege to be here. Um, and what a great man of God. What a great leader. And um, if it wasn't for you, I don't know where we would be. And so I'm so grateful. So thankful, really thankful. What, what many of you don't know or may not know is that Reverend Neil and I are almost neighbors. We live in the same neighborhood. Uh, in fact, he lives one street down from where I live. And uh, if I go to the second floor of my house and if I look in the window at, on the corner, if I stand on the windowsill and I look in the top side corner, I can see his house. <laughs> I was up there the other night with my binoculars. <laughs> An angel came up there and he said, what are you doing? And I said, nothing, nothing. And he, and he said, are you spying on the pastor? 
And I said, no, and he went, ay, caramba, ah, carambas. And he walked out going, caliente, caliente, caliente. And I said, I speak in tongues, honey, I know what you're saying. Would you, uh, but I want you to know that it, uh, we live in the, the same neighborhood and I'm a nosy neighbor. I'm one of those neighbors that you don't want to have. I, uh, I like to walk around and see who's doing what and uh, who's abiding by the HOA rules and who's not. And, and, uh, and by the way, David, uh, David, who's uh, uh, the, our director of music here at the church, you'll see him on Sundays, he plays the organ. He's the director of music here. Uh, he, him and Anita Hattie have been here for a very long time, and uh, David's actually moved in there too, and I'm well aware of the, situ of the circumstances of that, uh, because I am keeping an eye on that situation as well. Um, but I take my dogs for a walk so that I can uh, <laughs> see what's going on at Pastor's house, and um, of course my dogs are old and they really don't want to go walking. And uh, they just want to lay on the bed and go to sleep. And I'll look at them, I was like, come on, let's go. And they'll just look at me like, really, Daddy, do we have to go? And I, and I just walk down there. And I, I happened to walk by his house the other day. And I noticed the garage door was open. And uh, I, just out the corner of my eye, I try not to make it too obvious. But out the corner of my eye, I noticed that I think we have the same sprinkler system. <laughs> so I thought, well, let me go have a look. So I went and had a look, and I am proud to say that you and I, our sprinkler systems run at the same time every day now. <laughs> You're welcome. So uh, we are in sync in more ways than one. Um, our sprinklers, and uh, I want David to know, I don't see him, but I want him to know his sprinkler system is also running the same time as mine every day and pastors. So we will have green grass in our neighborhood. Would you stand for the reading this evening? We're reading from Mark 3, 1 through 6. Mark 3, 1 through 6. And we stand because the book is open and the book represents uh, God, the person of God. And so we stand in reverence. We're reading Mark 3, verse 6, uh, 1 through 6. And it reads like this. Then he went back in the meeting place where he found a man with a crippled hand. The Pharisees had their eyes on Jesus to see if he would heal him, hoping to catch him in a Sabbath infraction. He said to the man with the crippled hand, Stand here where we can see you. He wanted everybody to see. Then he spoke to the people. What kind of action suits the Sabbath best? Doing good or doing evil? Helping people or leaving them helpless? No one said a word. He looked them in the eye, one, one after another, angry now. I like that because it shows us Jesus was human, angry. Furious at the hard-nosed religion. Mm. He said to the man, hold out your hand. He held it out. It was as good as new. The Pharisees got out as fast as they could, sputtering about how they would join forces with Herod's followers and ruin him. Say amen for the reading. Uh, take your neighbor by the hand. If you, if you haven't met them, say hello. Greet them. Tell them your name. If you've wanted to meet them, you're welcome. Say neighbor. Say neighbor. I'm glad to be in church. The preacher needs your prayers and all of your amens. Because tonight's sermon subject... One voice. One voice. I've, had I've had enough. All right, say it again. I've had enough. I've had All right, have a seat if you can. I hope you will help me preach tonight because we want to get out before nine o'clock. <laughs> so I'm on an airplane coming back from the Dominican Republic a couple of weeks ago. And yes, I bought a house. They don't hate. And I'm on the airplane and I'm sitting up front there awaiting my cold beverage. And this lady gets on, I'm in 1B, and she walks in, and there are two people sitting 1C, 1D. And she walks in with her husband, and she says to the people sitting over here, she says, uh, you're in the wrong seat. And she shows them her ticket, 1C and 1D. 
And the two people in the front seat, they go, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. And they pull out their ticket and they go, oh, but we, I'm one, we're one C and we're one D. And, and she goes, no, you don't understand. Uh, uh, I specifically bought these tickets because my husband, we, we're flying to Miami. Uh, it's a two hour flight. We're flying to Miami to, uh, he's got to have heart surgery and I wanted him to be comfortable. So I sp specifically bought these tickets, one C, one D. And the, and the front two people said, well, uh, yeah, but we did too. And we're one C and one D. And so the trolley dolly, they called over the, uh, the air steward, air stewardess to come over, who uh, was clearly not Pentecostal. She was putting on her makeup. She, uh, <laughs> with, her, with her compact, you know, surely that should have been done already, but I'm not judging. She came over and uh, she walked over and they proceeded to, not a day over 18, and they proceeded to tell her the situation. And she, in her maturity, said, well, well ma'am, I, I guess you're going to have to sit somewhere else. And the lady said, but I, I don't understand. I paid for one C and one D. And I'm sitting, sitting there going, oh, Lord Jesus, there's going to be a fire up in here. And I just want my cold beverage. They don't do hot nuts anymore. But I want my beverage. And uh, anyway, and you know, they're talking about the plane's going to be delayed because these people are having it out. So finally, she, she says, look, I've got a seat in the way back there by the loo, by the, the lavatory back there. And I've got a seat over here in the emergency aisle. You and your husband will split you up and we can put you back there. And the lady said, you've got to be kidding me. It's I've got one C and one D. And, and the, the air stewardess, she said, listen, we got to take off. You need to go sit down, ma'am. Uh, we can sort this out later, but you're going to sit over there and he's going to sit over there and you need to go. The lady got so angry, she threw down her tickets and she said, I've had enough. It was 2011, and I, was, uh, I work for the government, and uh, believe it or not, it's a butch part of the government, and we have to go to this, um, this training called crisis management training, and I'm a psychologist. You'd think I wouldn't have to go, but I had to go, and they have it on an army base, <laughs> and, and it's in an army barracks, and it is traumatic. Uh, did you know there are no uh, separations between the toilet stalls? Generally, that wouldn't be a bad thing, but it is in the army base. There is no shower curtains. There, it's just an awful thing. It's an awful experience. And I was there and it was traumatic and I, I, I didn't like it. I didn't want to be there. And finally I got into bed. And of course the bed's about this size. It's, first of all, it's like sleeping on a rock. And it's about this size right here. Fortunately, I brought my sheets. I brought my own sheets. So I had my thousand thread count sheets with me. So I put, um, you know, I'd made my bed, put my sheets up, and, and I'm on, the, you know, it's about this big. I mean, you roll over and you're on the bloody floor. I mean, it's like you literally have to go like this. So I'm laying down and I'm thinking about this hell that I have found myself in, just trying to figure out how to get out of it. And uh, I'm, I, I put my mask on and I'm laying down like this. I'm getting ready to go to sleep. And these guys who are from the disturbance control team, DCT, you know, these are the big boys. I mean, they really have had their breakthrough in the gym. I mean, these are the guys they call in when there's a disturbance. Every one of them. Anyway, they, they start their machismo stuff, talking down at the bottom uh, of, of the hallway, and they start talking about all the beautiful girls in Puerto Rico. And I'm thinking, oh, whatever. And I'm laying there <laughs> trying to just focus, you know, to escape from this this world that I find myself in, in rural Alabama, mind you, so it's hot as hell. I'm in rural Alabama, and I'm laying down there, and they start talking about these girls that are so beautiful in Puerto Rico, and then one of the guys says, oh, but you know how Puerto Rico would be the best place to live if it wasn't for all the gays down there. And I lifted up my mask, <laughs> and I sat up, and I said, excuse me, would you please keep it down over there? I need to call my boyfriend. <laughs> I'd had enough. Anybody had enough in here? Anybody tired of hearing stuff from other people? Anybody need to find their voice? Anybody tired of their parents thinking they're going to change? Do you know that my parents fast and pray? Fast means they don't eat, bless their hearts. They fast every Friday all day long for me, fasting and praying that I would wake up one morning and, and God would suddenly change me and I will not be gay. Do you know they fast and pray every single Friday for me? I'm ready to tell them Eat! Eat! <laughs> Quit it! I'm not going to change! I've had enough! Anybody had enough up in here? Say amen. Anybody had enough? 
You want to tell your parents, you know what the Bible says? You know what the Bible says? Psalm 2710 says, if your parents, if your mother and father forsake you, I will take care of you. Yeah, I've had to hold on to that a lot. I will take care of you. God says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. God is with you. I've had enough. One voice, church. It's time for us to find our voice. It's time for you and I to say, enough is enough. I'm, I am going to stop having a pity party. I'm going to stop thinking about the guy or the girl that did me wrong, that did me in. I'm going to stop singing, do you really want to hurt me? Do you really want to make me cry? That's boy George. I know I'm showing my age. But... Uh, it's time to stop. It's time for us to say in one voice. It's time as a church to continue. As we continue in one voice to say, we are not going to be silent. We are going to speak out. We're going to tell the world about who we are. That's why we have such a great vision at this church. The vision is not just to keep it to ourselves, but it is to tell everybody. That's why empty chairs hurt my faith. Y'all, we, we, fr- listen, Wednesdays, we've got to fill this. Will you help me? If every one of us brings somebody, we'll fill it. Ew. There's people need to hear the, the gospel. They need to hear the reclaiming Christianity gospel. Not the first Baptist gospel. Oh, they got my glasses. That's Gucci. <laughs> Anybody fed up? Anybody ready to start using their voice? You know, as much as you want to think that churches are out there still accepting people, the forsaken, forgotten, and forbidden will never feel more safe and more secure in this place than anywhere else. I submit to you today, you try to show up at, at, one, of these other, at one of these Baptist churches all tattooed up, and if you don't think heads will swing around and fall off their bodies, you're blind. You show up in a mini skirt or with red lipstick on and see if people don't look right at you and wonder what happened. I've had enough. And try to be a person of color. Well, good luck with that. Try walking into some of these churches today after you've had some Patron that won't leave you alone, some Zinfandel that didn't treat you well, some gray goose that gets you loose, and see how they respond. Somebody say amen. You bet this is good. This is real good. You ought to be getting it. And watch how they respond. I've had enough. I have three points. I've got to move quickly. I'm Pentecostal. I'm used to speaking for an hour. So I've got to rush through this. But the first point is speak up. Recognize, church, your distraction so that it doesn't become your destruction. Oh, you ought to write that. That's good. You ought to write that down. (laughs) Recognize your distraction so it doesn't become your destruction. Too many times we allow the distractions in our lives to destroy us because we focus on them and we let them pull us down. And next thing you know, you're with Patron and Zinfandel. And before you know it, you've got so deep down in a hole, you can't even see the top to get out of it. And you're like, well, how did I end up here? It's because you're letting your distraction become your destruction. It's time for us to speak up and speak out. My first point is speak up. We've got to speak up. It's in the text. Why am I preaching this? It's because there are people here today who look good on the outside, but all bougie on the outside, but they are draped up and dripped up in the inside, hurting in the inside. I've come here today like a divine postman from heaven to tell you, church, that today Jesus is in the house. Tonight is your night. Today is the day that you can say, I'm going to find my voice. Today is the day that I've had enough. Today is the day that I'm going to confront the folks I need to confront. Today is the day that I'm going to make decisions that I didn't think I had to make. Today is the day that I'm going to let go of the chains, the things that have held me down. If you're here today with a need in your hand, in your heart, in your house, in your mind, in your home, then you ought to shout God, shout to God and say, God, I need you. I need you. Don't sit silently, but you ought to shout, God, I need you. You ought to tell God that every opportunity you get, I need you. It's in the text. The man has a name, but we don't know the name. They don't tell us in the name, but his name is not given. He's in the temple. And he has a wounded hand. It's interesting because his hand, according to Josephus, Josephus, the Jewish historian, says his hand was uh, that this guy was most likely a brick mason. And what happened was uh, he was not born with a withered hand, but according to Josephus, uh, he had a crushed hand. 
So the way it worked is, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, but the way it works with brick masons is you, you stand, they give you a brick, and you put a brick. They give you a brick, and you put a brick. They give you a brick, and you put a brick. And so more than likely what happened is he had a crushed hand. So more than likely is when they were handing him a brick to put down, somebody must have crushed it, or it must have crushed on one of the bricks. Isn't it interesting that sometimes the people that are the most closest to us are the ones that hurt us the most? You can shout out or say amen. amen. And on receiving and laying, somehow his hand ended up being crushed. Is there anybody besides me that's been crushed by someone that was close to me, close to you? Anybody been crushed by somebody that was right up near you, that had your address, might even, be, might even have been sleeping right up in your bed, might have been right next to you, might even be a family member? Tonight we're going to find our voice, we're going to speak up. Hang on, let me find your address. Some of you have been crushed by your spouses. Talking crazy to you all week long, and then you get to church and you act all, all churchy. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hey, how are you? Good, good to see you. But all week long, it's been hell on earth. Some of you have been crushed by those around you who pat you on the back and stab you at the same time. As you walk into work, they look at you smiling as soon as you walk out. They're sipping on haterade, talking about you in hateful manners. It's, it's former bosses, family members, sisters, brothers. It's people in the church. Sometimes the church folk are the worst folk. You, I, I'll just preach myself happy. I'll preach to myself. <laughs> what's amazing is, is uh, what's amazing is, uh, Reverend Aaron, is his hand is crushed, but it's not his face. So he can actually hide his hand. It's interesting because it's not his face. Had it been his face, he wouldn't be able to hide it. But his hand is crushed, so he can hide it under his clothes. But Jesus sees his hand. Jesus sees that his hand is crushed. Jesus sees what's going on in your life, church. You may think that you've been forgotten about, forsaken, forbidden, and that you've been left out in the cold, and, and that really you're just doing this on your own, and good, you know, well, good luck, we'll see how it goes, and you, you're on this journey by yourself. But Jesus knows your name. Jesus knows who you are. In fact, the Bible says that you were, before you were ever born, God knew who you were and who you are and who you were going to be. I think it's interesting that even though his hand was crushed, Jesus could see it and knew what was going on and was able to help him. See, his hand is crushed, which means he can fake it around certain people. How you doing? I'm fine. But meantime, back at the ranch, he's got this thing going on, this crushed hand, and nobody knows it. How you doing? I'm fine, blessed, highly favored. What's going on? Nothing. Meantime, back at the ranch, he's got a crushed hand. I'm crying inside and nobody knows it but me. Second point is speak out. We've got to learn how to speak out, church. We've got to learn how to be bold, to be strong, for the Lord our God is with us. We've got to learn how to, how to not be afraid to, to be the one to speak out and to confront those that need to be confronted. We have to learn how to be strong. We have to learn not to be intimidated because God is with us. God is with you. And if God is with you, who can be against you? If we believe this Bible that we stand by, then we need not be afraid. We have to learn how to speak out. Because when you speak out, it's amazing. People just, when you speak out, people just look and they go, oh, good Lord, where did that come from? <laughs> and that's not what we expect. We expect them to, to really flip out, but really they're just shocked that we spoke up in the first place. When I, when I said that to those people in the barracks there in, uh, in Alabama, they were shocked. They were like, good Lord, he speaks. <laughs> when you see a miracle... You ought to shout, speak out. There are people in the temple who seek to do damage to Jesus. Even his enemies, listen, even his enemies know he has power. Check this out. Uh, it's, it's in the text, and I, I found, I got excited about this, and I ran a lap in my house when I figured this out. And I missed it the first time. But check this out. It says, the Pharisees had their eyes on Jesus to see if he would heal him. You missed it too. It says the Pharisees had their eyes on Jesus to see if he would heal him. See, they weren't looking to see if he would, if he would heal, if he could heal. They were looking to see if he would heal. They already knew the power that Jesus had. It says the Pharisees had their eyes on Jesus to see if he would heal. They already knew that he could. They just wanted to know if he would. 
Because then they would open up another whole can of worms. Because on the, on the, on the Sabbath, you're not supposed to do anything. Even if it is a miracle. That Jesus says later on, when is it a bad day to do a good thing? Doesn't that sound like today? I mean, doesn't that just sound like you do the right thing and somebody's going to stand up and say something bad about it? You stand up for righteousness and truth and somebody's got something bad to say about it. Somebody's got something negative to say about it. You, you, you've come up and you say, well, this is, this is what I believe God is telling me to do. And somebody turns and says, you really? No, it's not. And you go, yes, it is. Did you hear the voice? No, I heard the voice. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> They're not watching to see if he could. They just want to, they know he can. They just want to see if he would. See, he can make things shrink. He can make a tumor shrink. He can make it dis disappear. He can pick you up. Whatever's broken, God can fix. And he did, and he can, and he will. God does not leave your healing up to folk who don't want you to have it. Whenever God wants you to have whatever it is, you will have it. Jesus says to him, stretch forth your hand. Stretch your hand out. He tells him what to do. Finally, speak loud. You got to speak loud. I was in the Baptist church, and uh, we had a lady that, that, that used to shout a lot. She used to come to church, and I used to think she was actually Pentecostal, but she wasn't. She was Baptist. But she, um, she used to come to church, and, and she would always shout. They, they used to uh, usher her to the, have her sitting in the back on purpose, uh, and because she, you know, she was a little disruptive. But she would shout out a lot in church. And, and finally, somebody went to ask her her story and, and relayed the story to me later. And what had happened is she had been laid out with cancer. And she was on her back with cancer, and her family was in there crying and yelling and screaming and, and calling out and doing this, that, and the other. And finally she said, everybody out, everybody out. And they all got out of the room, and she had a moment with God. And she said, God, I need you to heal me. And if you will touch my life, and if you will heal me, I promise you that every time I gather in your house, I will shout as loud as I can. And good God, if she didn't do it. <laughs> Every Sunday she came and she shouted out loud and praised God for her church. We've got to learn how to not be ashamed and to speak loudly. Whatever it is that's going on in your life, don't be afraid. Speak loudly. Amen. Speak up. Find your voice tonight. What is it that you need to say? Who is it that you need to speak to? What is it that you need to confront? What is it that you need to be loud about? Only you know what it is. And as I'm speaking, you know what I'm talking about. Some of you are sitting here going, yeah, I know exactly what it is that I need to be talking about, who I need to be talking to, and what it is I need to be talking about. If it's healing, whatever it is, if it's, if whatever, whether it's your body, whether it's, whether it's uh, your emotions, whatever it is, it, it is it's, it's, it, Jehovah Jireh is still my provider. It doesn't matter. God will take whatever it is that you bring to God and God will say, I've got it. All you've got to do is lean on me. Lean on me. We serve a mighty, mighty God. God wants to restore us. By, by us speaking out and finding our voice. When we find our voice, you know, the word restored means back up in action or running. God wants to get us back up in action and running. And the way we do that is we speak out. And when we speak out, watch what God will do. It's liberating. It's freeing. We have nothing to be afraid of. Why? Because God is on my side. And so therefore I can be strong and I can be bold. I don't have to be ashamed. I am not ashamed of who I am and I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it applies to me just as much as it applies to anybody else. I know that rattles Dr. Jeffrey's feathers and he's, having a, he's probably having a, a palpitation right now and choking on a pork chop. But the truth is God loves me and you just like he loves him. <laughs> Those of you who... <laughs> I tried. I tried. I tried. 
Those of you who came tonight with needs, I, 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 I've waited a long time to tell you this, uh, but I want you to know that it doesn't matter what's wrong, God can handle it. It doesn't, matter what's, it doesn't matter how big it seems, God is in control. You don't need to wait, you don't need to hesitate, all you need to do is speak loud. You gotta tear, listen, my, uh, I was in the U.S., I just arrived, and my cousin, uh, my other cousin that I haven't told you guys about, comes over, he's six, he was six or seven years old, and I had just started college, and uh, I had a little sports car, and uh, it was a Honda Prelude, in, in a little two-door, anybody remember the Honda Prelude? No, no, <laughs> thank you, I see that hand, I see that hand. Uh, so, so anyway, I've got this Honda Prelude, and my little six-year-old, you know, cousin gets in the car, and he's an oar, you know, because we didn't have, back then, we didn't have two-door cars in South Africa. They do now, but they didn't then. It wasn't as common. So he's all, you know, taken back by this two-door car, and, you know, uh, we get in there, and he starts asking questions, like six-year-olds do. And uh, he starts saying to me, well, what, what, what is, what, what, what is, what does the D stand for? And I'm like, well, that's for drive. And, and being the great uh, uncle that I am, I made sure I, I answered everything in complete sentences. And I said, no, well, the D is for drive, and, and that's what we do when we want to drive the car. What's the R for? Well, that's for reverse. If we want to reverse up, then we put it in reverse and then reverse up. Oh, what's the N for? The N is for, it's, well, it's neutral. It's, uh, I don't really know what neutral is, but it's there. And, well, what's, and, and what's the... Uh, um, and what, what is the, the, the red light on? I don't know either. I don't know. Uh, and what, what is the, the letters, the 100, to 120, the 60, the 40? I'm like, well, that tells you how fast you can go when you're driving the car. And he says, oh. And we, we're driving along, and, and he, he looks out, and he sees uh, this one of the, the signs on the side of the road, and he says, what are those things for? And I'm like, well, that, that tells you how fast you can drive, and that says 45, and if you look, you'll see we're going 45. And he says, but you, you said it, it can go to 120. I'm like, yeah, yeah. He says, well, either we need to go home and get our bikes or we need to tear down those signs. <laughs> I looked out the window. I didn't see the popo. I put my foot on the accelerator and I went as fast as we can. <laughs> and we drove down the road. Church, we need to tear down some signs. We need to tear down some stuff that is stopping us from going full throttle. Because I've had enough. I've had enough. I'm ready to get all that God has for me. I'm ready to stop being, uh, stop being restricted and held back. I'm, I'm ready to start saying, you know what? Hello, world. I'm here. I'm loud and I'm proud and I'm about to take over. Okay. Amen. Some of you are looking at me. You know, as an individual, you need to find your voice. You, you need to get your voice back. Some of you had it and you lost it. Quit running and worship. That's why I love what we do on Wednesday nights. We worship. Worship is healing. When we worship, we get it's healing. There's so many people get touched and healed just in the worship, just by worshiping. You've got to say, I need you. I need you, God. I need you. I need you, Lord. Every, every hour, I need you. Some of you are saying, Dr. Dre, I'm depressed. You sing, I guess that's why they call it the blues every day. Well, join the club, honey. Joy is not a feeling, it's a decision. You ought to write that down. That's good. <laughs> Joy is not a feeling, it's a decision. One voice. Receive and release. Receive and release. Receive and release. Amen. Thank you so much. How do I follow that? I don't know. I'll try to be funny. No, I'm not going to. That was an amazing word. Thank you so much. Um, that was really meaningful to me. As I'm doing the announcements, I'm like, ooh. 
to process that later. Um, so tonight, um, we are so excited that you're here. If you are here for the first time, um, I would love to meet and greet you down in the Ministry and Visitor Center after church. Um, and the pew side aisles, there should be red registration booklets. That is how we get in touch with you. That's how we know you've been here. That's how you can give comments to us or let us know if you want to be a part of the membership class, which is coming up in October again. Um, if you want to a prayer, that is the way that you get in touch with us, and we love to have you fill that out and let us know that you've been here. Um, we are going to be uh, partaking in the offering, which really is your time to give back. We have it in worship because it's your response time. It's your time to say with uh, the voice of the things that you have that you're all in. That speaks volumes as well, doesn't it? with what you have given here. Um, a few things to let you know about the ministries that are going on around here. Afterwards, you probably notice that there is a table and we are doing the blessing bags today. So you've seen them introduced and we've do been doing announcements. Some of you brought in stuff and thank you so much. Afterwards, you can put together some blessing bags and we'll explain a little bit more what that's about if you don't know after worship. And we'd love to have you join us um, in doing that. In a couple weeks, so next Wednesday, I'm preaching. Woohoo! Am I the only one excited? No one else is excited. It's okay. I was reaching. Um, no, but the following uh, Wednesday is the 28th. And if you notice in your, in your bulletin tonight that we have an amazing guest with us, Brian McLaren. Um, how many know who Brian McLaren is? So his books were transformative for my faith. I'm not even exaggerating. And this is an amazing opportunity. This is the only spot. He's a prolific author in the Christian world. Um, he sort of goes between progressive Christianity and evangelicalism. He speaks many Christian languages. And he is, this is his only Texas stop in the new book that he's, that's coming out, the only Dallas stop. And so this is a great opportunity. If you have friends, if you have maybe Christian friends that you wouldn't maybe have brought here and they don't have a church, or if you have friends that maybe you, you thought you could get them interested by this interesting author in a book, that is a great Wednesday night to invite someone. So I invite you to do that. Um, and then for those of you who have signed up to be a part of um, Pride with Cathedral of Hope, how many have signed up to do that? We have a huge group, over 350, we have a huge group. Um, I'm so excited. And um, so this Sunday, we would love to have you get your t-shirt and your fan. That will happen after the nine o'clock and after the 11 o'clock services. And we also wanted to give you a little preview, a little preview of that. So we have over 350 people yeah. signed up for Pride. And we're gonna be singing the power of one as we walk along in the parade yeah. route. We haven't got the routine down yet, but it's just gonna be something really easy so y'all get a sneak peek of just how this is gonna work. As Roscoe leads us in this um, endeavor. Okay. Let's start taking the offering. power of one joining the hundreds of millions of people believe y'all sing with me come on the power of one don't hang around stand up or sit down and believe we can change the world together we can change the world together is a totally unplugged night. That wasn't supposed to be our offering song, but we're already going, so we might as well just keep it going. Uh. What if it all depended on me to change the world, to change the world? What if my only responsibility was to change the world, change the world? Let me be Let me sing my song to the people of the world. And it all begins with one power of love. Join in the hundreds of millions of people believe in it. One power of one. Don't hang around. Stand up or sit down. 
And change the world, change the world. Let me be the one who can start a revolution. Let me sing my song to the people of the world, to the children. So we'll actually have a routine by Sunday, we promise. <laughs> oh, we really will. <laughs> you can be seated for a moment. So uh, this sermon series is The Power of One, and we cannot help but just acknowledge this evening the one who changed the world so powerfully for each and every one of us and that life that is Jesus. And it's that Jesus that compels us to allow our voices to count and to make a difference. And so we're about to receive communion, but I believe that communion can be expressed in many, many different ways. And one of the ways that we'll be expressing communion when we leave this place is through our blessing bags. You know, many people brought in lots and lots of goodies this evening that have been put into these blessing bags. And as you leave this morning, you're in, uh, this evening, you're invited to take those blessing bags with you and put them in your car, so that, or wherever you, whatever mode of transport you use. And then as you pass by uh, some folks who might be homeless or uh, at the end of freeways and they've got their signs saying, you know, homeless and hungry, um, we're going to invite you to take one of those blessing bags and bless them with it. Because in there is uh, some food and there's some uh, sanitary products and uh, there's information about where they can get more help. And for them, that's communion. It might not be being here this evening to receive of the bread and the cup, but for them, that's communion. That really is what Jesus, I think, instituted on that last night when he was with his disciples, was to know that there is power in every single one of us to make a difference and to change the world. So this evening, we remember as we take this bread from the table, and we give God thanks and praise, and we bless it, and we break it. And we pass it around to each and every one of us who's gathered in this place this evening, and we say, this is my body. It's given for you. Take and eat of it as often as you shall do so, but always to remember me, said Jesus. And in like fashion, he took from the table a cup. He again gave you thanks and praise. He again blessed it, and he again passed it to each and every person. And he said to them, take and drink of this, all of you, for this is like my blood of the new and everlasting covenant, a promise that I make between you and the rest of humanity that I will be with you until all the ends of the days. 
And that if you would just experience the power of one within you, the power of me living in your life, that you really can change the world. And so as we bless this meal, we also bless those blessing bags, knowing that those who receive it from our hands will be the re remind themselves of their own power, the power of themselves to change the world. Would you pray a blessing with me? God, we pray that you would bless and sanctify these gifts of bread and fruit of the vine, that they may become for us, as we understand it, the body and blood of Christ. And in the same way, we bless our blessing bags, that they might be blessed with the power of blessing for those who will receive it. We pray, O oh God, that we might claim our voice this night and in that boldness speak it out loudly to a world that is hurting, a world that is fragmented, a world that has been damaged in so many ways. And we get to reclaim that power this night as we receive from this table and as we give those bags, those blessing bags to those who are vulnerable and who have suffered at the hands of brokenness of our own humanity. So may this food fill us to overflowing and may it be in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, we're all invited to this table this evening. Not one of us is left behind. Every single one of us has a life that counts. Every single one of us has the power of one within us. So come to receive at this table this night. Come alone, come with friends, come with loved ones, come with family members. Come that you might be able to receive fully and deeply of this promise. And if for any reason you decide that you don't want to come forward for this meal, that's, that's just fine. No one forces you. It's not peer pressure this evening. But know that wherever you are on your journey, God will meet you right where you are. Whether you step forward or whether you remain in your seat. You see, we believe in that power of God to meet us this night. So as the ushers come forward and the servers and ministers of prayer come to set this table, know it's been set for you this night. And if you're in need of more prayer this night, know that there will be prayer warriors on the ends of both of the, these sides, one by the piano, one over on my left, your right, that you can go to at any time for prayer, for healing, and to perhaps reclaim that voice that might or might not have been taken away from you at some point in your life. The table is set, the meal is prepared. Come to this feast.
Jesus, my Jesus, my Savior, forever I give you all of me. I give you all of me. My Jesus, my Jesus, my Savior, forever I give you all.
life is not my own to you I belong Lord I give myself I give myself to you see my life my life is not my own to you I belong to you I belong I give myself, I give myself. So folks, please remember that uh, we have uh, Pulse Cafe directly after worship. We encourage you to take a few moments just to greet one another and to get to know each other a little better. Perhaps this evening you might take opportunity to go and meet somebody that you haven't met before uh, and reach out in that, that very simple way. Also, uh, Reverend Andre was talking a lot this evening about reclaiming our voice. And uh, over the last few weeks, WFAA have been here in church and have also followed some of the life stories of some of our congregation. And over this week, and uh, more than likely on Sunday evening, there will be a 30-minute documentary on Cathedral of Hope and our voice in reclaiming Christianity. So uh, check out WFAA website for details of that, but uh, we are really making sure that our voice is heard, especially on this Pride Week. So go in peace and know that God's voice is within you. God bless you. Amen.